All right, in problem 20, we have that h is a function defined as the integral from pi over 4 to x of the sine square root of t, dt. Which of the following is an equation for the line tangents to the graph of h at the point where x is pi over 4? Okay, so when you're doing these problems that are asking for the equation of the line, you know, don't forget your fundamentals, right? I mean, don't forget your knowledge for one or middle school or eighth grade math, wherever you learn the y equals mx plus b equation. But let's remember your ultimate um goal. Find an equation of a straight line at a specific point, at a point, pi over four, comma, well, we're gonna find out. We have to find what the y value is. So, but remember, you're always finding the equation of the line. This is slope intercept form. Um, typically, they'll have their answers in point slope form, where it's y minus y1 equals n times x minus x1. But they're same, they're the same thing. It's just algebra. Usually, this is a little more user friendly when you're solving. Um, but they're both the same thing. It doesn't matter what you do. Anyways, if we're going to try to find the equation of a tangent line, that means we have to find the derivative at the point pi over 4, comma, whatever the y value is. Um, we'll get to that in a second. So we have to find h prime of x. We want to find h prime of x because we want to eventually find h prime of pi over 4. So what is h prime of x? Well, let me tell you. This is usually you might get confused. Or this is probably where the problem is trying to confuse you. Um, let's remember and, and understand and recognize that Differentiation and integration are essentially like inverse operations. They undo each other. So when you differentiate an integral, in this case, when you want to find h prime of x, you're essentially canceling out this integral. So h prime of x is simply going to be the sine squared of x. That's it. That's that's it. Remember, t is a dummy variable. Um, it's kind of a so you don't repeat that x variable, but it's the same thing as the, as, as the x variable. Um. So then we have our derivatives. Now we just evaluate this function at pi over four. So the sine of pi over four, as you should know, is square root of two over two. We square that, so we're taking sine squared of pi over four, which will then be two over four, which is one half and it's simplified. So we have our slope, we have our m, now we need to find our y1, and we have our x1 already. Our x1 is the pi over 4. Now, what is going to be our y1? Well, you have to simply evaluate what is h of pi over 4 going to be. So that'll be, remember, that, that's what y is. y is a function of x. y is h of x. And if you're going to evaluate this integral at pi over 4, that means you're not going to go anywhere. You're going to just go from pi over four to pi over four. So it's basically just zero because you have no area. As you should know, it's, it's, it's nothing. There's no area. So H um, or the, yeah, H of pi over four or the Y value when X pi over four is just gonna be zero. So our Y one is zero. So our point slope form will be Y minus one, zero equals one half times X minus Pi over four. And so the answer will then be B. All right, 21. All right, table above gives selected values for a twice differential function x, which the point must be true. Okay, I'm going to tell you right here, since I read this problem that this is going to involve the mean value theorem. And this kind of helped you understand this as best as I can. Um, I'm going to try to just draw a, a picture of what's going on. Uh, not a good picture, but just something. I have a visual. Let me do down here, actually. So I'm just basically just going to draw the graph. So a negative 1, negative 30. Zero, negative 2. 310 and 518. Now, after on the scale, now what's the point of this? Well, you know, lots of points, but 
The main point is for you to recognize that all the information, the only information you're essentially given is that these points are on the graph. We're told that the function is, you know, twice differentiable also, which means it's continuous so that we know there's not going to be any holes or discontinuities. But we don't know like how the graph behaves between these points. It could be very, it could be maybe just a straight line between each point. You know, maybe it does this, but it could also, you know, do this. Or I could, you know, just do something, you know, I don't, it doesn't, who knows? Because if it lies, it's not good to do something like this. We don't know. We just know those points are on the graph and that's differentiable or twice differentiable. And so it's continuous. Um, the, ball, the point is, is that we really can't say any certainties about critical points. We can't say there's no critical points for sure. It's possible there's not, but there's possible there's several. There's a, there could be a bunch, maybe here, here, here. There could be a lot. Um, I'm gonna get to B in a second. Please, please actually answer. But um, the the point, the first thing you want to recognize, is you can't say anything for certain. You can't say things about the about the way the derivative behaves, or even the second derivative, um, with certainty for all the values because we don't know what's going on with all the values. All we have are five values. So you can't say the derivative is always positive for all the values. You can say for some of the values for sure, but not for all of them. We don't know that. It could be, but we don't know. Um, same thing for the second derivative. We don't know if, if the second derivative is negative for all the values. It could be for some of them or all it could be, but um, you know, it could be concave down. Actually, let me think of it. If it's negative, that means the first, it's definitely not down because the second, that means it's just, well, it's definitely not D. We have enough information actually um, to, to know that it's not negative because um, if the second derivative is negative, that means that the first derivative is decreasing. And it's definitely not decreasing because it goes up by, um, it goes up by 28 over 1. And it goes up by 12 over 3. Then it goes up by eight over two. And actually, I take that back. <laughs> it's actually that actually could be possible. Um, because the second, the first derivative, the derivative is um, the slopes are getting lower and lower at these points, but only at those points. We don't know what's going on. So that's why we can't say for all values. So in either case, I'm correct, I guess. But my apologies for kind of confusing me there. Um, and same thing with E, you can't say there's like, you don't know if there are any points of inflection. You don't, you don't know again what's going on before, between, um, but this is a little more involved. But this is a problem where you're gonna, this is a, this is a problem that um, we're gonna test your knowledge of the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem. This is something that I, um, I will be reminding my students constantly because the mean value theorem is a big deal. Make sure you don't, um, Insult the mean value theorem, especially when you're on the math professors or in the AP grades, because they're going to be offended. Break it down because it's a big deal in math, at least. With, and that says that for some, if the function is continuous on an interval, then there's going to be some value in that interval where the derivative at that point will be equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. In this case, there's some value C in the interval from negative one to five, where F of five minus F of negative one is equal to five minus negative one. F of five is 18. F of um, negative one is negative 30. You can just actually calculate it by counting. It goes up by 48 over 6. So 48 over 6. So across the entire you know, interval, the function increases by 48 over 6. There's, or the slope essentially, the slope when you connect the endpoints is plus 8. So um. So you can grab a ruler, but, your screen, right? but the point is, and remember, this is not drawing scale. The point is, is that if the function is continuous on this interval, 
there's going to be some point in the interval where you can find a tangent line that has a slope of eight. So when you connect those endpoints, that's what it's essentially saying. Um, this is something you really want to make sure you understand. I, and I recommend um, actually writing out the theorem and drawing a picture to go to go with it because it's again, it's a big deal. It'll usually be um, part of a fear response problem or even the entire fear response problem will involve it and you really have to understand it. Um, I might go through this in another video more thoroughly, but um, I don't want to, you know, too much time on this, but that's essentially the idea. All right, moving on. All right, 22, physics, yes, the particle moves along the x-axis so that at time, t is greater than or equal to zero. Acceleration of the particle is a of t is equal to 15 square root of t. The position of the particle is 10 when t equals zero. And the position of the particle is 20 when t equals one. What is the velocity of the particle at time t equals zero? Okay. Um, this is gonna make this is gonna test your knowledge of how the um acceleration, velocity, and position functions are related to one another and how their integrals work. So let's just let me kind of just give you an overview. Position, you know, or the derivative of position is velocity, while the derivative of velocity is acceleration. What that also means that is if you're gonna if you're gonna um find the acceleration, if you have the, if you're gonna integrate acceleration, let's say in this case from zero to one. That's going to basically give you, that's basically going to involve you evaluating the antiderivative of acceleration, which is velocity. So that's going to be equal to v of one minus v of zero. Likewise, if you're going to integrate velocity from zero to one, that means you're going to have to evaluate the position at one minus the position at zero, It'll be s of one minus s of zero, because the position is the antiderivative of velocity. And so forth. So this is kind of what you're gonna um have to um use to some extent. Um it's really up to you how much work you go with on um, how much work you use on these problems because again it's a lot of um a lot of this your conceptual understanding and you just under having some good sense of you know kinematics and physics. Anyways, so what I would recommend is figuring out what you have to what you, figuring out um exactly what of which of these you gotta find and what you're given because I'll save you some time. Okay, so we wanna find the velocity at time t equals zero. So we wanna find v of zero. That's our goal. Now let's see what we're given. We're given um we're given position at zero and we're given position at one. We're given s of zero is 10. And s of one position at s is 20. So we're given that. And we're also given the acceleration equation. So we're gonna go from here. Okay, so we wanna find we want essentially we want to find an equation for velocity. We have to find the equation for velocity because then we just simply plug in one and solve it. Okay, so we have acceleration. Acceler let me use this to work down here, I guess. Acceleration is equal to 15 t to the one half. So to get the velocity equation or function, you're going to take the antiderivative of this because remember you're going from the integral to the derivative, but just the equation in this case now. So velocity will be, remember again, the antiderivative would be like kind of a reverse power rule 15 t to the three halves over three halves plus some constant plus c. I'm gonna call it c1 because we're gonna have another constant for another part of this in just, in just a minute. So um, v of t, what we know so far about it will then be, this is simplified to 30 over three, this is simplified to 10, t to the three halves plus c1. So we know that so far. Now, um. What we can now also do is find 
um, the position function from the velocity equation. We just take the antiderivative of velocity. So we take the antiderivative of this, of this function. Again, the approach it like you're integrating. So this will be 10 t to the 5 halves over 5 halves plus c1 times t plus c2, because you have to then have another constant potentially. So an S of T will then be 20 over 5, will be 4 T to the 5 halves plus C1 T plus C2. So we have to solve for our, our constant C1 and C2, and we're given information to help with that because S of 0 is going to be 10. So jump into this. If S of, if S of 0 is 10, that means that when you plug 0 into this equation, you're going to get 10. So 10 is equal to that falls away, that just becomes zero. It just becomes zero plus zero plus c2. So I mean c2 is then 10. So c2 equals 10. Then that means what we know about position so far. Is that it is equal to 4t the 5 halves plus c1 t plus 10. But what we really need is c1. But we can find c1 now from this from this part because then we're also given that the velocity or the position at t at one at time one is 20. So then we just solve this one. We solve this one for 20. So 20 equals 4, 4 t or 4 times 1. Because remember, it's just, it's just 1 plus c1 plus 10. Because again, we're evaluating, we're evaluating this equation when t is 1. So it says 4 times 1 plus c, c1 times 1 plus 10. And so we have 20 equals 14 plus c1. So then C1 is then going to be 6. So we know C1 is 6. Then our velocity equation, and our, we, we, we know our position equation, that'll be just you know, plus 6t plus 10. But we really care about our velocity equation now. That's the key. So now that we know it's 6, we can write our velocity equation as C of t equals 10t to the three halves plus six. And now we just evaluate this. When um when we evaluate, evaluate this when t is zero, because that's what we're looking for. So v of zero, going up here, v of zero is just six. This is zero plus six. And so our answer is b. Now there are faster ways to, to do this problem. And it's just, um, if I don't have to spend a lot of time explaining and showing all the work um, and just using some logic, but obviously I'm teaching this. So that's why I did all this work and did all this um, explanation. Cause I know physics, especially if you haven't taken physics, um, when these problems creep up on you, they can be a little intimidating. So I like to, you know, make sure I show you a lot of, I want to show you, you know, a math way to do it because this will always work, but anyways, Side note, right, let me see if I can do one more. So 23. Okay, which of the following is the solution to the differential equation dy dx plus 2xy over x squared plus 1 whose graph contains a point zero one? Okay. And so what we got to do is essentially um solve for solve for y. So we're gonna basically integrate this and solve for y. You saw this is a differential equation. You know, we use separation of variables. So then we divide, we're gonna multiply both sides of one over y. So we have one over y, dy, and then multiply the right by dx. So one over y, dy equals two x over x squared plus one dx. And we're gonna integrate both of these sides. 
Okay, now as you should know, the antiderivative of one over y will be the natural log of absolute value of y. Here we're gonna use um good old fashioned e substitution. You know, you can't recognize it right away, but um our u will be x squared plus one. And it works out really nicely the du will be two x dx. So this will be the integral of one over u du. I use the position. And then so the natural log of the absolute value of y is equal to the natural log of the absolute value of u. I put u, but let me just say some writing. Or the natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus one plus c. Don't put it your constant. Big deal. Now um let's go ahead with solve for y. So we're gonna have remember this is these are a base e. So e to this whole thing will equal y. So e to the natural y, it has to value of x squared plus one. Let's see if it's y. Now, this is the same as, you know, e to the natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus one times e to the c, just by the power rule. Let me just write it down to see. Give me a little refresher. So e to the natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus one times e to the c. Now, this e to the c, this guy is just some constant. Remember, e is a number and c is a number. So we're just going to call this all just be our coefficient. So we're going to write this as y equals a times e to the natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus one. And now we just solve for a by using our initial condition that goes to the point zero one. So if it goes to the point zero one, that means when x is zero, y is one. So using that, that means we can have one is equal to a. Look at this pencil y equals a times e to the natural log of zero squared, which is zero plus one, or e to the natural log of one. Why did I put equal times? So the natural log of one, or e to that whole thing, that'll simply just be. That would just simply be um, your, um, zero. That's, that's pretty easy, I think. Yeah, I, I guess that was easier. That kind of confused me for some for for, uh, for a second there. So that just means this is just a times one. So just your a is one. So then, because remember, e this would just be e to the natural log of one. The natural log of one is just zero. So this is just. Let me just write it out in case it's a little confusing. A, one equals a times e to the zero. E to the zero is just one, so it's just a times one. So a is just one. I hate cramming it. Remember, a is one. So then we can write our equation as y equals one times e to the natural log of x squared plus one. Let me bust up the pen. So y equals e to the natural log of x squared plus one. Now, using the properties of logarithms, when you raise a log, uh, you know, uh, exponential to you know the same base logarithm, this you know these kind of just go away. So y just equals x squared plus one. And you don't have to worry about absolute value because you know any number squared will be positive. So then your answer will be B.